I wish to welcome um, our uh, special guest in the optimistic uh, meetings uh, cycle, uh, Dr. Juan Kuderk uh, from uh, the School of Classics, University of St. Andrews. And uh, we are uh, most grateful for your time. Um, I know that you have a very busy schedule um, and I appreciate very much that um, you uh, share your experience uh, with us. And before I make um, a short introduction, please let me welcome also those who have uh, the future of the classics in their hands. So the uh, teachers and the students from Bartłomiej Nowodworski High School in Kraków, uh, from Strumienie High School in Józefów, and from Mikołaj Rey High School in Warsaw, Magde Animo. And uh, I welcome also all our friends and colleagues uh, and the audience from all over the world and nunc de hospite nostro pauca verba dicere velim in Anglite. Dr. Juan Koderk um, was born in Barcelona, where he obtained a PhD with a thesis on um, Apollonius uh, of Rhodes. And for several years, he worked in secondary education. Uh, in uh, 2003, he moved uh, to the University of Oxford to teach ancient Greek and Latin for the Faculty um, of Classics. And in 2007, he moved to the University of St. Andrews, where he works as a senior language tutor. Um, and his main interest is uh, the teaching of uh, Greek and Latin using the life method. And he has published some translations of modern classics uh, into Greek and Latin. I can show you uh, The Little Prince and also uh, Don Camillo and um, Sherlock Holmes. And on Juan's website, I will, uh, I will paste it later into uh, our chat. Uh, you can find uh, more uh, details, including uh, a free PDF uh, copy, uh, for example, of his translation of The Little Prince. So uh, now uh, I wish to... Um, uh, to welcome uh, Juan uh, again very warmly, and he will talk us uh, today about reaching the classical authors through Oscar Wilde and Sherlock Holmes. So, uh, Juan, the Zoom is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I, if I cannot be heard properly at some point, just let me know it. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to uh, Katharina for the invitation. In fact, uh, the way we got in touch, Katharina and I, a uh, couple months ago, was a curious one. It was because I saw an advertisement about that Latin translation of the Hunger Games, uh, a book translated into Latin, which I bought, and the translation into Latin is excellent. And we got in touch just because of that book. Then, after some emails, after stopping some emails, we decided um, to make a talk about my own translations. Well, first, I must say that this is not an academic paper, even if it was advertised yesterday in the classicist mail list, where usually the are, are advertised uh, research academic papers. This is not an academic paper. This will be just a, a kind of friendly talk. And then uh, I would like just to make a kind of a super fast um, biography of mine. I will now go to um, share screen. So you will see, you will stop seeing my face. I have done, uh, the, I have prepared the presentation in such a way that you don't have to be watching my face for half an hour. So I will just press share screen choose this and let's see if it works. Okay, theoretically, you should be seeing now, uh, this will disappear now. Is everybody seeing this, the title? Yes. Well, then, uh, well, that's me, uh, Juan Cudert, University of San Andrews. And uh, the first thing I would like to say is um, this one. Uh, to begin with, that's the city where I was born, Barcelona. I was born there. And uh, I took my degree, a five-year degree in classics there at the University of Barcelona. There I got my degree. And uh, later, after getting my degree, I studied a Master of Arts here at the University of Sheffield. That's a picture of the University of Sheffield in the UK. And after finishing my degree and my MA in Sheffield, degree in Barcelona, MA in Sheffield, UK, then I began teaching in a high school, in a secondary state high school in Spain, with the usual um, boring grammatical system. So uh, that's me teaching in my high school, usual boring system, uh, students did not like it, I myself did not like it. And meanwhile, during those years, um, I also did my PhD. Finally, I finished my PhD degree. 
And there, while I was teaching in a high school, I don't remember how, uh, I started to get in touch with uh, those people who wrote the news in Latin from Finland, from Helsinki, the so-called uh, Nunti Latini, the Latin journalists. Remember that in Latin, Nuntius may mean both the news and the journalist. So uh, there was that website that I don't know how I got to know, and I saw, uh, oh, look, uh, the news uh, nowadays, uh, nowadays news written in Latin, how interesting. I'm going to show you, uh, for instance, this. This, for instance, was um, a piece of news of them, uh, European elections. So uh, the elections uh, in which delegates for the next five years uh, we, uh, were chosen uh, took place last week in all the members of the European Union, etc., etc. This was a piece of news in Latin written by Nunti Latini from Helsinki, a website that uh, unfortunately does not exist anymore. It was closed down some years ago, but uh, it was excellent. It was my first contact with, let's say, live Latin, Latin that was something else than just Cicero, Seneca, the classical authors. So uh, then, of course, if I had found this website where they published the news in Latin, I thought, ah, probably there is also the same in ancient Greek. And I started looking for it, but I found nothing. Then I looked for it, I contacted several universities. Does anybody know if there is an equivalent to this website but uh, publishing the news in ancient Greek? Nothing, it did not exist because of a problem. Here in Latin, as you can see, <laughs> we write Latin uh, using the Latin characters, the same letters we use. But in Greek, there is the problem of the Greek alphabet, taking into account that in those years, Unicode did not exist yet. And the problem was that either the writer and the receiver had the same font, or all the receiver would see would be mathematical science. Unicode did not exist in that time. So finally, I solved the problem. I created Acropolis World News, where from time to time I write news in ancient Greek. And I solved the problem by transforming my texts into an image. So what I did is type the text in my computer using whichever font. I transformed that text into an image through a screenshot and I uploaded the screenshot. So in fact, uh, students were reading, uh, were reading a picture. So I created Acropolis World News at the beginning of the year 2003. And for instance, this is the last news I published before yesterday the news about the disturbances that are taking place in Israel. So I will translate it uh, quickly. So it says, um, if I will follow with the cursor, if recently uh, the French uh, citizens suffered disturbance, now the same situation, we see the same situation in Israel. The president Netanyahu wanting to introduce some changes into the legal system, the disturbances began already last week. Even if, um, even if in a low key way. Nevertheless, the disturbances growing up every day, yesterday, the problems through the country became so many and of such a kind that it was necessary to close the Ben Gurion airport. Even if the prime minister trying to diminish, to minimize the disturbance had now announced yesterday that he would retire the change, he would retire uh, the introduction of the new laws for some time. This for some time did not please the citizens and the disturbance remained. So this is for instance, um, the last news I published before yesterday, 28th of March. So I started doing this, uh, publishing news in ancient Greek. Uh, at the same time, um, suddenly uh, one year um, in 2003, uh, just a little after I had started my website, and I think that this website had a lot of things to do, I moved to the University of Oxford. I moved there, everybody has heard about Oxford. 
uh, each colleges, etc. I moved there when I was there uh, during um, four years. And of course, I, I took with me the website, which was not in a um, personal server anymore, but in the server of the university. And there, while I was in Oxford, I published my first translation into ancient Greek. So I said, uh, well, let's stop writing the news, or rather, let's go on writing the news in ancient Greek. But at the same time, let's write, let's translate some well-known book into ancient Greek. And this was my first translation. Uh, in the same book, I published uh, one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes. Later, I will tell you which one into ancient Greek. And also one of the stories of Don Camilo, for those of you who know Don Camilo uh, of Giovanni Guareschi, Don Camilo and Pepone, those humoristical stories. One of the stories of Don Camilo and uh, Pepone by Giovanni Guareschi published together with the, one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes. It was published by Mefexis Editions in Thessaloniki. Uh, but even so, even though I was satisfied, I told myself, okay, I'm writing now the news in ancient Greek, and I'm translating modern works, um, modern books into ancient Greek. This was not enough. I wanted something else. And there was a problem. Uh, students, especially my students, still had the problem that when they were in front of a Greek text, they felt the Greek or the Latin text, uh, not as a kind of friend, but like an enemy, like a hurdle they had to surpass. It was an enemy they had to fight with. And I didn't want them to consider a Greek text, a Latin text, like an enemy. I wanted, to consider, uh, I wanted them to consider it like a friend, like a friend who teaches you, not like an enemy that you have to defeat. So here we will see a student trying to understand Cicero or Plato after finishing the usual language course textbook. Whether it's Athenaze or living Greek or whichever method you use, uh, when they finish this textbook, the usual first year course uh, textbook, they are confronted directly with Plato, Cicero, uh, Thucydides, directly with classical authors. It's a very large jump. And here we see the typical student confronting an original classical author without uh, enough training, just after, after finishing the last chapter of the textbook. And they see it like an enemy to be beaten, not a friend. Here we have the poor student fighting against uh, Thucydides, against Cicero. Um, they need something else than just a text. They, they lack something. So most of the times when they finish uh, the textbook and they are confronted with, uh, with unoriginal authors, when the teacher says, okay, you have finished the last chapter of the textbook, uh, Athena, Jeff, Living Greek, whichever book. Now here you have to see this, start translating. No, the gap is too large. The gap is too large. Uh, and then what do we need in order to go from the end of the textbook to the real original classical authors? Well, uh, we need this. That's what we need. We need a bridge. Uh, we need a bridge, but what does it mean we need a bridge? Uh, it's just translating a classical, sorry, a modern author into Greek or into Latin, is, is that enough as a bridge? No, we need something else. So I decided not only to go on translating, but moreover to translate in a special way. I decided to adopt the so-called Herberg style, which means a text with Latin, with side notes written in Latin itself, or a Greek with side notes written in Greek itself. And then, when I was already in San Andrews, I had already moved at the University of San Andrews. Here we have a sample from Herbert's book. This is a sample from um, Lingua Latina per se illustrata, written by Herbert. You, have, you can see here the text with, sites, with um, side notes written in Latin itself. As you can see, the notes are written in the same language not translated into English, into German, into Italian, just written into the same language. Uh, this is the so-called uh, Erberg style. So I decided to adopt this. Then in 2007, I left Oxford and let's go to 
University of San Andrews, where I have already been for 16 years. I came here in 2007, so this is my 16th year. And when I was already here at the University of San Andrews, I told myself, okay, the next translation I write, I will not only translate it into Greek or into Latin, but moreover, I will use the Erberg method. And in pure Erberg style, I wrote The Little Prince. This is the first book I wrote in Erberg style. The Little Prince with vocabulary help. So uh, who does not know this book? The Little Prince is uh, very well known. Here we have, for instance, a screenshot of the page where uh, it deals with the little prince arriving to that little planet where there is a king. The only inhabitant is a king. And as you have seen, apart from the translation into Greek, on the left side, the explanations for difficult vocabulary, difficult grammatical constructions are written in ancient Greek itself. So I don't use any other language. I explain ancient Greek using ancient Greek. Then I wrote The Little Prince. Uh, it was quite well received by the classics community. But then I said, well, I have written uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, into Greek, uh, Don Camilo uh, into Greek, The Little Prince into Greek. I should write something into Latin. So I said, why not translating the same book into both languages at the same time? And this was my next book, The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde into ancient Greek and Latin, both translations in the same book, using the same Arabic method. Into Greek, this is the very beginning of the play of uh, the importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde. As you can see again, side notes for the Greek translations, for the Greek translation are written in Greek itself, and also into Latin, the same. Latin text and the notes on the side written in Latin. Then, for instance, this sono clavicordi o caso, this is an ablative absolute. For some students, this ablative absolute could be too difficult. So I wrote, I wrote it here as a temporal clause, postquam sonus finem abet, after the sound finishes, when in the ablative absolute, in fact, it says the sound having died. So, for instance, I explain this ablative absolute using a temporal clause to make it a little easier. Then, well, this is a, these are the things that I have done. Then, why have I done them? Why those books? How have I done them? Which problems have I come across with? First, decisions to be taken when you translate. To begin with, which books to choose? Well, they have to be books that are um, well known. You cannot choose a book that nobody knows uh, because it will not attract anybody. It has to be something that uh, calls people attention, uh, well-known books. Then, to begin with, why Sherlock Holmes? As I have said, um, who has not heard about the cases of Sherlock Holmes? They are really very well known. And then, why the case of the three students? The book I translated, the case of Sherlock Holmes I translated, was not one of those so well-known books by Oscar, by um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, was not, for instance, The Hound of the Baskerville, who is possibly the most well-known case of Sherlock Holmes. No, it was um, the case of the three students, which happens to be one of the least well-known cases. But I chose that one. Why? because it's a case that deals with three students of ancient Greek. Three students of ancient Greek that have to make an exam uh, fighting for a scholarship, and it happens that the teacher, the day before the exam, finds out that some of the students, sorry, one of the three students has sneaked, gone secretly into his office and has stolen the text. So one of the three students knows already which text they are going to be given as translation. And he goes to Sherlock Holmes and, uh, please, Mr. Holmes, help me. We have this exam. And I know the, that one of the three students competing for a scholarship uh, has found out which text I will give them tomorrow. And the exam is tomorrow. Please uh, find out who it was. So it was possibly the only case of Sherlock Holmes dealing with students of ancient Greek and Latin. This is why I chose this one. 
Moreover, I asked Professor Christopher Telling, Ligius Professor of Greek, University of Oxford, and he found this, uh, the best case to be translated. So I translated this case because it deals with three students of ancient Greek, even if it's not one of the most well-known cases. Then why Don Camilo? Uh, this was a personal reason um, because when I started to grow up and I stopped reading what you usually say, what you usually call comics, and I started to read real books, the stories of Don Camilo and Pepone by Giovanni Guareschi was the very first book I read when I stopped reading comics and I started reading books. This was my very first book. So I, can, I have a kind of um, personal, emotional depth with Giovanni Guareschi, with the author. So I chose uh, La Processione, The Procession, one of the adventures of Don Camillo and Pepone. Not a very long one, but um, humoristical enough to be translated into, into ancient Greek or Latin. Then, why did I choose The Little Prince? Well, possibly, uh, apart from the Bible, you will not find uh, another book uh, so well known all around, all over the world. The Little Prince, who has not read The Little Prince, who has not heard about it? Uh, the question is, is it a book for children or for adults? Everybody says, oh, you know, the philosophy of this book is very complicated. Uh, like for instance, that drunk man that uh, drinks wine the whole day. And when the Little Prince uh, asks him, ah, why do you drink so much wine? Um, to forget, uh, to forget what? To forget that I'm uh, drunk, that I'm uh, boozer, to forget that I drink a lot of alcohol. So I drink alcohol to forget that I drink alcohol. So it's a book for adults. Yes, it may be a book for adults, but the irony of the situation is that all of us have read it when we were in high school, even in primary school, I would say. So it's a book, it's a book for adults, but everybody reads it in primary school. But well, I chose it because it was so well known that I thought uh, it's worth translating it into ancient Greek. There were already three Latin translations of The Little Prince. Uh, no one in Greek, so um, I did it. I translated it into ancient Greek. And then why Oscar Wilde? Well, because I have always liked Oscar Wilde, and especially I have always liked that comedy, The Importance of Being Ernest. It's a comedy I find quite funny, especially I, for those of you who have read it, I love the character of Lady Bracknell. My favorite character is Lady Bracknell. For those of you who have read it, you know whom I talk about. So I chose Oscar Wilde and that comedy, who is one of his most well-known well -known books. Then how do I manage, for instance, um, with modern vocabulary, because in, when I have to write my news in my website or, or I have to translate uh, the, the Little Prince, etc., how do I manage with tanks, airplanes and trains? How do I translate this? First, deducing how they would have been among ancient Greeks. For instance, um, even nowadays uh, in modern Greek, they say aeroplano for airplane. I prefer to use aeroscaphos. I prefer to use the third declension neuter word Scaphos, scaphus, and I, I prefer to write aeroscaphos. Or siderodromos, for train, or tethorakismenon harma, for tank. So harma, you know, it means chariot. Tethorakismenon, tethorakismenon harma. A protected, a protected, a queerest chariot, so a tank or how they would have been among Romans if I have to translate it into, into Latin. Uh, for example, the first example is um, constipatio raedarum. I wonder if somebody guesses uh, what constipatio raedarum means. Raeda raedae, as you know, means uh, a kind of chariot. What is a constipatio raedarum? Um, of course, I cannot see uh, now the public watching the watching the talk, but um, I cannot see anybody raising their hands. But well, I will tell you, constipatio raedarum means traffic jam. That's the way I say in Latin, traffic jam. Constipatio, blockage of cars. Or statio traminum. Statio traminum, this is easier, train station. Then, uh, well, this is the way I deal with uh, modern vocabulary. 
Then, when you translate a book, there is an Italian uh, motto that says traditore traditore, which means translator traitor. They use the, this kind of pun because the, both words sound almost the same. Traditore traditore, like saying um, a translator will always be a traitor, which means a translated text will never be the same, will never sound the same as in its original language. Is this Italian expression true? Mm, partially. If you want to say such a simple sentence as, um, I like reading this book, this will sound the same in whichever language you translate it. Or this boy is very tall, this girl is very clever, this will sound exactly the same. But of course, when it comes down to translating idioms, translating feelings, um, then it's not the same. For instance, in Latin, the typical problem is how to translate the word family. Uh, how do you translate the word family into Latin? For instance, yesterday I went to the park with my family. Most people will translate family like familia, but no, it happens that in Latin, familia is not only your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, no, the term, the Latin term familia includes the slaves, the slaves that live under the same roof, in the same house with you. Uh, so in, in these cases, yes, we could say that a translator will always be, a traductore will always be, even if a little, a traditore. Of course, it would be excellent to be able to read all the texts in their original language, but sometimes uh, it's not possible and you need a translation. Then the best example of the difficulties that you encounter when translating these kind of modern books into ancient Greek or into Latin. I'm going to offer you uh, the problem I found when translating The Little Prince. This was uh, my first problem. Our friend, The Little Prince, Tobasilavion in Greek, falls in, falls in love with, with a rose. Or how romantic, a little child falling in love with a flower. Very nice. In the original French version on the Petit Prince, the noun Petit Prince is masculine, and the noun Rose, La Rose, is feminine. So I have there a masculine character falling in love with a feminine character. Okay, let's translate this nice romance into Greek. But uh, we had a problem. Well, I had a problem. The problem is that in Greek, both Little Prince and Rose happen to be neuter. Torrodon, the rose, neuter. Tobasilavion, the little prince, neuter. Uh, as you know, I could not put uh, Hobasileus. This would have been the king. And there is a king. There is a king in the book. One of the characters that appears on a planet is a king. This is a little prince. The little prince I had to write as the little king because the concept prince, son of the king, did not exist in ancient Greek. And as you know, in almost all languages all over the world, in almost all languages, diminutives are neuter. Uh, remember in German, the little girl, das Mädchen, yeah? das Mädchen, a little girl, is neuter, because Schen is the diminutive, that is the suffix that makes it diminutive. Das Mädchen is neuter, and it means a little girl. To Basileidion, neuter, the little house, to Oikidion, in almost all languages, diminutives are neuter. So I had one neuter falling in love with another neuter. This is not what uh, the author of The Little Prince wanted to reflect. Wanted to reflect, sorry. So I needed a masculine and a feminine to reflect the original French. So what do you do in these cases? You ask for help to be, uh, from people who know more than you. So thank you, Professor Stephen Halliwell. Professor Stephen Halliwell, uh, professor of ancient Greek uh, here in St. Andrews, who knows uh, 20 times more Greek than me, he found a solution. He found for me the solution. In Theophrastos, there is this word, anthemis, anthemidos, that means flower. It doesn't mean rose, but at least means flower, and is feminine. Because it happens that the word flower, anthos, anthus, is also neuter. So I told myself, okay, instead of a rose, let's say a flower. But no, anthos anthos is also neuter. So I needed a feminine. 
And finally, he found this for me in Theophrastus. You know, Theophrastus wrote a lot about botany, about plants. And Professor Stephen Halliwell found this word. So I replaced the rose with anthemis, anthemidos, that means flower. Uh, I didn't find anything else. So here we have the famous traduttore, traditore. Somebody could say, Ed, the, the French author wrote a rose. You have written a flower. Yes, but uh, if you find something else, if, if you find a rose in feminine in, in Greek, uh, congratulations, it will be a pleasure to know it. The only thing I had available was anthemis, anthemidos, uh, flower. There was no way for the little prince to become a masculine character. If I wanted it in... In condition of the rose, of the flower. At least it was now a child, even if neuter grammatically, falling in love with a rose. Um, a little note has appeared now with my screen saying the internet connection in uns is unstable. Mm, I, I hope it goes on being right. Uh, can you confirm if it's right? Now it's all right. Uh, okay, I, suddenly I have seen the note, your internet connection in, is unstable. Then, well, apart from these problems, uh, there are also other problems. For example, this is um, part of the importance of being earnest of Oscar Wilde, uh, where in his humor, uh, Algernon says, my friend, um, it pleases me a lot to hear other people uh, speaking wrongly about my relatives. Only this allows me to put up with them. Uh, relatives are really burdensome. They have no idea about how to live and they have no idea about how to die. Well, as you can see in what I have uh, highlighted in green, oxolum mesinit eos pati. Only this allows me to put up with them. Uh, then relatives are really burdensome and etc. Well, I could translate it this way as I did, or I could translate it this way as I did not. I could join the sentences using nam because only this allows me to put up with them as they are very burdensome, etc., etc. So I could leave short sentences, so short sentence, full stop, short sentence, new sentence beginning with and, or I could try to make long periods here, nam, joining it with a former sentence. Here, producing a subordinate causal clause instead of just a, a new clause starting after a full stop, a subordinate causal clause. Um, this is another uh, thing that um, you have to decide because usually Greeks, uh, Greek uh, writers and uh, Latin writers used long periods. Uh, take Cicero and you will find that um, four or five lines uh, are just one single sentence with a historical cum, an ablative absolute. Uh, then inside the historical cum, moreover, there is a relative uh, clause depending on it. Instead of just short sentence, full stop, short sentence, full stop, short sentence, full stop. Then what do you do? Do you remain faithful to the author or do you remain faithful to the way Latin and Greek writers would have written it? I made a kind of medium term. I made a kind of medium, medium term, not long Ciceronian periods, but not just simple sentence, full stop, simple sentence, full stop. I made a kind of medium term. Then another problem when you translate these uh, books, let's make a journey to nobility. In Oscar Wilde, uh, there are counts, uh, and there is a count, there is a duchess, uh, there is a prince, uh, there is a lord. How do you translate lord? Well, finally, I had to simplify these names. For instance, for Mr. in Latin and Greek, I took just Dominus and Kyrios. For Miss, I took Dominula and Despoinida, diminutives, because for Lady, I had already taken Domina and Kyria, which would be the feminine of Dominus and Kyrios. So dominula, the diminutive of domina, and despoinida, which is a kind of diminutive. 
and then for Lord. For instance, I translated Lord as praefectus and eparchos in Greek. There is no equivalent. The nobility titles do not correspond between languages. Then there are the problem of puns. For instance, in the importance of being earnest, uh, Lady Bracknell uses a lot of puns. Uh, let's see the sentence. The English, the original um, sentence in Oscar Wilde says this, when Lady Bracknell uh, makes the joke that um, somebody was abandoned like a child in a train station and somebody found him there in the train station and adopted the, that baby that was abandoned there. Um, she says, until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families of persons whose origin was a terminus. Of course, Oscar Wilde plays with the pun that terminus, meaning the end, is also the way usually in the UK uh, we, we call the last station of a train. And that baby, the main character in Oscar Wilde, had been abandoned in a train station, in Victoria Station. So uh, she plays uh, with the pun that the origin is a terminus. So the beginning is the end. So I had no idea there were people whose beginning was the very end. So uh, whose origin was a terminus. How to translate this pun? Well, let's see how I translated it. Into Greek, I wrote this. Progartes thizines gemeras ego uc ede hoti ge polon genon genesis teleutaios stathmos eye. So I translated just origin as genesis and terminus as teleutaios stathmos. It does not reflect exactly the pan, but it approximates it. And in Latin, I wrote nam ante diem esternum nescievam inter nos homines belgentes ad esse cuius origo terminus esset. Maybe the Latin version approximates more the pun of origin, origo, terminus, terminus. Maybe the Latin version um, helps more to keep this pun. Well, this is the way, the kind of problems I find. But, well, once you have done uh, this, for instance, uh, I have translated um, Oscar Wilde, the importance of being earnest into ancient Greek and Latin. Then, the most difficult pun was this, the title, the importance of being earnest, because as you know, in the title, Oscar Wilde plays with the double meaning of earnest being a proper name, somebody called earnest, and the, adje the adjective earnest, that means being serious. So the pun is uh, something that has created a lot of difficulties to translate the play into several languages. Ernest, so the importance of being Ernest, of being somebody called Ernest, as could, could be somebody called Peter, and the importance of being Ernest, being a serious person. In many languages, it's difficult to translate this pun. How did I solve it? Well, fortunately, I found these two words. For Latin, I found Severus. That means a strict person, a serious person, and at the same time is a name, somebody called Severus. And the same for Greek. I found the word spudaios, that means not exactly the same as severus. Spudaios means rather somebody diligent, hardworking, and at the same time, spudaios is also a name. People were called spudaios also. Well, with this, the book was finished. Then what was uh, left to do? Let's make the book reach the descendants. Now I wonder if somebody could tell me who the person holding the book is. The person on the right is me. The person holding a copy of my book. I wonder if somebody would have any idea of who this person is. Of course, I cannot see anybody raising the hand because I'm uh, sharing the screen. So I wonder if anybody could, uh, could say who this person is. Well, this person whom I had the pleasure of visiting in France, he had the pleasure of receiving me in, in his house in France, is the grandson of Oscar Wilde. This person is the grandson of Oscar Wilde, who is called um, 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 Merlin Holland. He does not keep the name Wilde. He's Merlin Holland, resident in France, in Burgundy, the grandson of Oscar Wilde, whom I had the pleasure of uh, offering one of, 
a copy of uh, my translation. And I would say that this is all. So, uh, gracias, Maxima Zabo, and Harindidomi.